From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Well, uh, if, you're, if you're not already going through a COVID fatigue, um, well, then you're in the right place or the wrong place. I don't know. You're, you're in a place. And we're going to talk a little bit about COVID and COVID conspiracies. Um, and it turns out that according to a study released uh, today from YouGov Cambridge Globalism Project, um, it found that uh, of 26,000 people that were surveyed in 25 different countries, there is quite an alarming trend of people believing that COVID-19, the coronavirus, is a conspiracy. And we can kind of divide that up into a couple of different categories. But one of the most, this article comes from The Guardian, uh, the headline is an article that came out today, the 26th of October, 2020. Survey uncovers widespread belief in dangerous COVID conspiracy theories. And um, one of the most widely believed COVID conspiracy theories is that the death rate of the virus, which, um, as I believe, according to Johns Hopkins, reached uh, over 1 million people worldwide, 1.1 million, um, there is a pretty widespread belief that this number has been exaggerated. 60%. And, And the thing that's interesting that Ben and I were talking about off air about this study is that it is worldwide. And we often, you know, the news that we're served typically, especially around this, since it's been so politicized, uh, we hear a lot from folks from the voting populace here in the United States. But this is a global pandemic and people have opinions about it all over the planet. And according to this uh, uh, survey, nearly 60 percent of those who responded in Nigeria felt that the number was definitely or probably uh, exaggerated. Hmm. Yeah. Um, greatly, uh, exaggerated in fact, and deliberately, um, in Greece, more than 40% of respondents felt this way. Um, also South Africa, Poland, and Mexico, um, had around 40% of respondents feeling this way. And then 30%, 38% rather of Americans, 36% of Hungarians and 30% of Italians. And then, bringing up the the rear with 28% of Germans all feel like this number 1.1 million is a hoax and that has it has been greatly exaggerated for political or some nefarious purposes um which is so interesting considering that you know folks in these other countries don't really have the same political axe to grind mm-hmm. as folks here in this country um and since it has been so politicized interestingly uh, in, in my opinion it's it seems like such a easily confirmable thing based around science and yet it has been sort of used as this divisive element um in this election very clearly even things like wearing masks has become such a politicized issue of of you know if you do wear masks. There's some that would say that is a sign of of weakness in some way or, you know, that you're being duped. I don't really know what to make of these global numbers. What what, what do you guys think? Well, I I would just say, while it does feel like there is quite a bit of misinformation and disinformation floating around out there on the internet that we've talked about several times on the show before in other COVID episodes, um, there is a troubling thing that we have noticed that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that the numbers are being overly exaggerated, but it does mean that there are problems with the numbers. And mm-hmm. and this is this is uh, let me explain this. Um, we've gotten messages from a lot of you listening out there who are in positions at hospitals, positions of other care facilities, where there seems to be a bit of an issue when it comes to describing someone's death and the nature of someone's death when sure. that person appears to have contracted the coronavirus and is experiencing the effects of the of COVID-19 um, when they are also experiencing the effects of other illnesses that they've been grappling with or a you know a heart attack or another uh, possibly fatal event that is occurring with that person's health 
So I think it I think it is a I think it's based in a true thing where there is a bit of confusion when it comes to actual hospitals and facilities in the in the reporting of the death of an individual um, on whether or not it is COVID related or COVID was the reason this person died um, and just how that's how that's being treated. That that, that would be my. I, th- I think so. that's an excellent point uh, because it's something we explored in our previous episodes on COVID, which still hold up despite the fact that we did not have all the information. And like a lot of people, I think we were a little optimistic about how long the pandemic would or would not last. But you're right. It's tough to find. It's tough to determine with solid methodology what counts as a COVID related death because what you're describing matter comorbidities. Someone already has heart disease, right? Someone already is immunocompromised due to one condition or another. Uh, then would they have, did they just die of a heart attack while they also had COVID? When, you know, in, in such a way that COVID did not truly contribute meaningfully to the death? It's a good question. And also, <clears throat> what I really like here, Noel, about the global look at this is it helps people in the West understand a very, very important thing about other regions of the world, which is their relationship with conspiracy theories. Just because every country has some version of the internet does not mean every country approaches it in the same manner. Uh, The Middle East is rife with conspiracy theories. Just look at our earlier work on animals as spies. I'm sure there are some more news stories about that. If you If you look into the numbers and uh, you see the types of uh, theories that are commonly accepted as fact here, you'll see that a lot of people in parts of Central Europe, uh, parts of what I guess you could call the the bridge of Asia, Western Asia to Europe and uh, large parts of Africa, uh, you'll see that a lot of people believe that the Chinese government created and spread coronavirus on right. purpose and that's simply that's not necessarily people being actively deceived that's the communicative game of telephone because everybody sees uh, everybody sees research that largely agrees it came from somewhere in China so the next step is just to ascribe agency uh, in place of incompetence which is a comforting thing about conspiratorial thinking Oh, a lot of these things um, point to sort of a comfort factor where there, there's a really great quote. Um, there's an interview in this piece from a cognitive psychologist from the University of Bristol named Stephen Lewandowski, who talks about how who is actually an expert on misinformation and the way it spreads. And he talks about how in an, in a time when people are feeling powerless, this can give people a sense of psychological comfort and a sense of taking back the narrative and like owning their own destiny in some way by choosing to believe some of these, you know, perhaps more fringy theories. And the interesting thing is I completely agree with you, Matt, of all of the theories discussed in this, the one about the death toll is certainly the most easy to understand why people would believe that because it is problematic. Even the whole notion of, Oh, we test more, therefore we have more cases. Mm -hmm. I've always struggled with that one a little bit, but when you think about it, there's a little something to that. You know, it's not to say that if we didn't test, there would be no cases, but when the, when you test more and you start to things get lumped into being COVID related, but not necessarily completely caused by COVID, that sort of muddies the waters a little bit and can make those numbers inflated. But when you come down to things like it was manufactured and disseminated purposefully by the Chinese government, that starts to become a little more, uh, you know, where are you getting this information from? Or the idea that it, that it was caused by 5G technology. That's another piece that was uh, people were surveyed by. And a surprising number of folks believe that, that um, it was either deliberately created by the Chinese government or that it was caused by 5G mobile technologies. Um, It was something in the neighborhood of a fifth of respondents in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, and Turkey, uh, and also South Africa believed it was definitely or probably caused by uh, the, uh, quote, caused or enhanced by the direct physical effects on the human body of 5g Mm. yeah there's a there's another thing here that i want to address 
which is the most popular the most popular theory that I believe YouGov found in their study. Um, by far and away, it's the belief that there is some sort of international cabal conspiring to affect the uh, spread or the degree of fatality in COVID-19. And the thing is, to a degree, it is correct that there are cabals in play. There, like we find whenever we look at world controlling organizations, there's there's usually throughout human history, there's not one big shadowy organization controlling the world. There are multiple organizations who want to control the world and they don't get along with each other and they they are rivals but they will work together when necessary. So yeah, there are members, whatever country you're listening to this show in, there are members of your government and members of your business elite class that have conspired to pursue opportunities, often unethical, as a result of the chaos of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're, that doesn't mean like the Bilderbergs are getting together and saying, all right, let's tick the fatalities up 2% in Sweden, lower them by four in Peru, and then sell some lithium. They they don't, like people would do that right. if it were possible, but they don't have the, they don't, they don't have the logistical ability to do so yet. Hmm. No, and, and, and we I believe you made this point on a previous episode we did about the coronavirus, about how if this were the case, wouldn't they have picked a more effective biological weapon you know, that, that had more of a, you know, 100% chance of, of taking out those infected. Whereas this one, clearly there's a lack of understanding as to how it works. And that's, to me, the scariest part is just not knowing. And, um, and I have to ask you guys, and I'm sure it's out there, but have you seen a spread of like age, ages affected and ages in the mortality group? Because I mean, we we hear you know we hear occasionally a, a news story about oh it can affect young people too or a child died, but I would I'd, I've never seen a, a chart like or a graph that measures like you know the age and the age spread and and actual numbers uh, and and where those kind of net out. I haven't seen a global version of it, like a, a macro version, but I've I've got some from a couple of different countries, especially countries that did a better job tracking COVID cases uh, they, because they already have that data. They have all the demographic data you would imagine entirely because of their process of tracking infections or possible infections and playing the Kevin Bacon game, which the U.S. has not done in this regard. It's a dark lottery. You know, it's true that most of the people who contract it will not die, uh, at least immediately from COVID. However, we know that it has long-term deleterious effects on various bodily systems. So it's possible, quite possible actually, that in the next 10, 20 years, maybe sooner, we'll see a, a, a higher level of heart failure or a higher level of respiratory-related conditions that can be traced to this pandemic in 2019 to through 2020. So we we have what I'm saying is we have the data. We just don't have it for every country in the world. Um, it is it is true that age is a factor. Children seem to serve more likely to survive. Uh, the older you get, the more likely it is that you will have uh, a serious medical condition as a result of contracting COVID. Uh, but again, in the absence of transparency and the absence of information, speculation thrives because that's the one thing that humanity is very, very good at, creating explanations, especially when there are none readily at hand. Yeah. No, it's very true. Um, well, and then speaking about vaccinations, that's one of the other big parts of this questionnaire, right? Of the, the survey. That's right. That's it's right. How, how do you feel about a, a vaccination that would prevent you from ever getting it? And it seemed like there was a whole lot of skepticism about of, of possible vaccination. Yeah, not only that, though, uh, the survey at large revealed uh, something of an anti-vaxxer sentiment overall, that, that vaccinations aren't to be trusted. And um, of the 19 different countries that responded, 
um, they there were twenty percent of uh, or more of the folks that that uh, that answered the survey that said they felt there was at least some credibility to the notion that the truth about the harmful effects of vaccines is being deliter- deliberately hidden from the public, mm. uh, and that was. 57% of South Africans, 38% of French people, 38% of people in Turkey, and 33% of Americans, not to mention 31% of Germans and 26% of Swedes. So, I mean, that's significant that just in general, like, you know, not just this vaccine, any vaccine, and not yeah. to mention there's certainly been discussion or the idea of quote fast tracking this thing, you know, and like what that would look like. And are you bypassing, you know, these kinds of safeguards that, that actually make sure that there aren't any, you know, horrible side effects that that might be unseen at the time. That's why, you know, it's important to vet these kinds of things, but in a situation like this, where there's so much pressure to put something out as soon as possible, I understand that urge, but when people are already distrustful of vaccines in the first place, and I know even before this study came out, there was a lot of us uh, of, uh, of surveys in the U.S., or at least maybe it was just anecdotal, but it seemed like I was hearing a lot of sentiment from folks saying, I don't even know if I would take it if it came out tomorrow. Sure. I mean, I'm uh, to a degree, I'm one of those 33%, at least in regard to the way Russia uh, rolled out its quote unquote vaccine. You know what I mean? Uh, they did something that uh, Cold War Americans would stereotype as the Russian approach, which is throw bodies at a problem until mm-hmm. a solution exists, right? That's why there's still rumors of lost cosmonauts. And that's why people uh, distrust uh, the Russian coronavirus vaccine. However, uh, Brazil had just a, a company in Brazil, two companies have decided to start producing it. Uh, there are multiple studies that are coming out <laughs> a lot from RT and the Moscow Times uh, touting touting the popularity of it. But we have to understand, you know, people's position on this does not automatically mean they are not exercising critical thinking. There is a problematic history of vaccination, especially on the African continent. And it is to a degree tied up mm. with colonialism. People aren't just making up these fears out of whole cloth. But that being said, you know, we have we have trials for a reason in in the modern world. And if you I I think it's less a matter of being so-called anti-vax as it is more a matter of personal safety when you're thinking about personal safety with regard to any medicine. Any medicine that has powerful uh, powerful effects or efficacy needs to be tested extensively before it gets to you know John and Jane and Joe and whomever. Uh, I I would I'm completely on board with a tested vaccine, but I'm not completely on board in all honesty with an untested vaccine being given to anyone unless they try unless they sign up for a trial with full informed consent. Oh, I I'm with you. No, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. I, I do think it, uh, one thing this uh, this survey did that I thought was really interesting and certainly would be for us and our listeners is they sort of did a a B comparison with some popular non covid conspiracy theories like the, the notion that the moon landing was faked or that global warming is a hoax or like you said, Matt, the big one was this whole international cabal thing. That's sort of the idea of like this consortium of secret societies, you know, that's at the center of so much you know, conspiracy, uh, Charlie Day, pegboard, string, you know, kind of situation stuff. Um, and they found that uh, a, a very similar proportion of folks that believed that the coronavirus was a hoax also believed that the moon landings were faked. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, we talked about it before. It feels like people's willingness to believe in a particular conspiracy theory is increasing. Um, and it does feel like we're on that track. I think it probably has something to do with social media, also with just the internet in general, where I think humanity is going to be on a steady incline when it comes to that kind of uh, thinking because we have access to so much more information and not all of it is perfect. Not all of it is correct. 
and other stuff is correct and is perfect, and it makes you question the nature of organizations like governments and <laughs> corporations and power structures. So uh, it 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 all of this makes very much sense. I think that we're that we're at a place where we're between twenty, like what what was it, twenty percent and fifty percent of people believing in a lot of these. <laughs> And governments conspire against their people. No, it's yeah. not made up. Governments and companies conspire. I'm We've sorry got, to shout. That's okay. We've got another. Not the next story we're going to talk about is uh, just that. Well, and, and you're you're 100. Both of you are absolutely correct. And and of course we we that doesn't take much of a leap at all to accept that that's the case. The very nature of politics and policy and and governing requires some degree of of subterfuge and deception. That's just that, you know, we talk about things like spycraft and all of the intrigue and we assume, Oh, I only do it to the enemies. Of course that's not true. They do it in, in, in w- w- whatever makes sense for them to do it in whatever way gives them the upper hand. Uh, and a lot of that upper hand is over us uh, as citizens. Um, and I'm not saying the U S government is inherently evil or worse than any other government, but I just think, you know, it's foolish to, to think that, our best interests are always at heart. And I, and I will say too, that I think the reason to your point, Matt, that that, that number is going up is because so many of these types of conspiracy theories and conspiratorial thinking have been mainstreamed in a very real way um, because of the internet, but then because of people in power and, and the notion that, you know, are the, the president uh, in, in campaign events, especially in recent days after getting COVID-19 himself and emerging unscathed supposedly you know uh, be, after getting the best medical treatment humanly possible is is, is leaning into this conspiracy notion pe- peddling this idea that the media is blowing up all of these numbers and with all of that in, in insecurity and doubt in the first place I, i'd be surprised if it wasn't working which uh, president <laughs> which president are you talking about because there are multiple do you mean trump do you mean bolsonaro Oh, exactly. Do you mean? Uh, do, do you perhaps mean presidents from a couple of Southeast Asian countries? I I think it's very important not to single this out, because just because you're president or used to be president at some point in your life does not mean that you are necessarily a great or an intelligent person, or that you ever got out of the dirty business of politics. <laughs> 